three, two, one. All right, Scott, we're live. Good to have you back on the show, man. Oh, oh, Brian, it is great to be back on the show. The bearded nerd, that is the best kind of nerd. So I'm so, uh, so happy to be talking with you again. I appreciate it, but I do like your background, by the way. Very fitting for this event, for this uh, episode. Sure. And I like yours. Also very fitting. You know, science fiction, and that's what we're going to talk about here today, uh, it always starts at home. People tend to think of it as being really out there. But the whole point of sci-fi when it was originated was to help us learn important lessons about ourselves through a lens that was different. And so, yeah, gorgeous. I feel background. Star Trek did that a lot. I feel absolutely. That absolutely. Star yeah, Trek George. really did that. And it hit on topics that you would normally not think about. It hit on some actually tough topics. Oh yeah, the original series definitely uh, was was groundbreaking when it comes to television. Uh, during the 1960s, you know, uh, in in the last century, the struggle for civil rights here in America. Star Trek is always hailed as a progressive show, a show that talked about that and dealt with that with the first interracial kiss on network mm -hmm. television between Uhura and Captain Kirk, and then the games that Star Trek and and all of our other favorite sci-fi uh, properties influenced and sp inspired. Uh, they give us a chance to tell our own stories with an, an eye toward important topics like that but it doesn't always have to be heavy if you don't want it to be heavy like that true and i mean and and that's the beauty of sci-fi right i think it's a little bit di sometimes i feel it's a little bit different than fantasy and i'm actually yep. i was trying to pull up a quote here but my phone's not working my, my phone's a little slow um <laughs> there, there it's you know with <laughs> fantasy it's one of those things that because let's be honest um, and, and for the folks listening right now, Scott is a longtime friend of the show, get for, you know, has been on the show before you are, a, you host your own show called what a piece of junk. Um, and it's, you know, and I feel like with, with sci-fi, you know, fantasy, whatever, they have great interminglings, right? They have mm -hmm. different things that they share with one another, but I feel sci-fi kind of takes it forward, right? Fantasy typical uh, high fantasy, medieval fantasy kind of stays within the past, right? And mm -hmm. it stays within that certain block where you can, you can do some cool stuff with it, but it can only take you so far. Right. And the other reason that I feel science fiction is always my personal favorite between the two genres mm -hmm. is that um, science fiction always, good science fiction has that feeling to it of, you know, this, this might could just possibly happen someday because it's mm. grounded in scientific principle. And the best sci-fi tabletop role-playing games, which is what we're going to talk about today, they keep that air, that atmosphere of, yes, it is fantastical, but it's mm. grounded in science so that it could possibly happen someday. Um, Star Trek is a lot more closer to could possibly happen someday. I agree. Than your, your other big uh, uh, sci-fi franchises uh, and big science fiction games, um, primarily because so many of the people that have shaped the world that we're living in right now were big Star Trek fans so they worked on making those new technologies come true. And it was a little easier because when the writers for Star Trek got together in the 1960s, they tried to extrapolate from what they had seen around them and, and, and basic scientific principles that we knew to be true when they came up with their seemingly amazing technology like warp mm -hmm. drive and, and impulse engines and phasers and that sort of thing. I mean, let's just look at these phones we were just talking about, right? This is a pad from Star Trek. You know, this is a touchscreen yeah. computer from Star Trek. So when I sit down to play uh, um, Morpheus games um, or Mephidius games, I'm sorry, their Star Trek uh, role-playing game that they have these days, um, some of the stuff that my character does doesn't seem all that far-fetched to me because my character might bop out their tablet, their pad, to look up something about Klingons. Well, during the game section at the table, if I want to, I can use my pad to look up stuff very about true. Klingons, right? That's very true, yeah. We have the technology to, um, and it's funny that you mentioned that, we have the technology where we can actually go in and say, hey, you know, I want to look at this thing and Star Trek did the same thing, right? It, it's, it showed us, and, and I feel like at the heart of something like Star Trek, it was about people, 
It was about the person, the characters. Mm-hmm. You were you you were actively building, and and you mentioned something um, that I want to add to it. Where is that? This could be something that is possible. Versus right. Star Wars. I love Star Wars. We yep. we've had this conversation before. Yeah, Star Wars is space medieval fantasy. Exactly. Yeah, totally. Uh, George Lucas is very upfront about how the work of J.R.R. Tolkien and other fantasy authors influenced him when mm-hmm. it came to making Star Wars. I mean, let's 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 be honest. You you have uh, all the classic fantasy tropes with uh, Obi Wan Kenobi as the wise and old wizard. Uh, the yep. Force is basically a type of magic. Um, and the way that the uh, world building for Star Wars treats outer space, people do things in outer space that they'd never be able to do in "quote unquote" real outer space here on Earth, you know, around Earth. You know, uh, I used to tell people, "Look, we can either have physics or we can have the Force. We can't have them both in the same universe." We tried that and it just tore itself apart. So pick one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, though. Um, I mean, and and then you mentioned Ben Kenobi, or well, Obi Wan Kenobi, aka Ben Kenobi. Mm-hmm. If, you know, if you. Remember the classic Luke never called him Obi Wan. He just he knew his name. He just said, "Nope, I want to call him Ben because that's what I know." Yep, um, yep. He was the wizard. He was the wise and wizard that. And actually, I had a someone commented about a wizard's tower that I, I I spoke about how the the necessity for that wizard's tower in fantasy RPGs is a great thing because um, you have that location where the wizard and then in this case. Ben Kenobi had his little home that was, it was mysterious. It was almost out of the way. And mm-hmm. Ben Kenobi himself was this old veteran, obviously of the clone wars and, and, and a great Jedi, but was almost um, made himself this person who was just, Oh, that's just Ben Kenobi. He's crazy. He's yeah. weird. He's whatever yep. he is. I'm going to distance myself, which again, a very classic fantasy trope that you, as you mentioned earlier, and and I and it's funny how it, it's funny how you mentioned that because you know it kind of triggered those thoughts in my brain, and I feel that with sci-fi we don't get those classic maybe cliche tropes. We get more um, unique characters, right, and unique yeah. races. For example. Um, you know, we spoke about the Klingons. They're a, gr- you know, yeah, they may be based off some real world, um, cult, you know, cultures and civilizations, mm-hmm. but they're really unique within their own uh, frame of, I guess, existence. You could say. Yeah, so originally the Klingons had this like Asian flavor, almost pan-Asian, not quite Japanese, not quite Chinese, not quite Korean. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they were a sort of a stand-in for the, the communist menace back in the 1960s, right? Mm. But Star Trek did something differently than a lot of its contemporaries. There are episodes of the original series, and of course moving on into the next generation and Deep Space Nine, uh, where our Federation heroes um, – meet up with the Klingons in a way where they treat each other as equals instead of just as adversaries, right? Mm. They took the time for Kirk and Commander Kang to talk about what was happening. And occasionally the narrative in the original series has the Klingons and the Federation having to work together against a greater threat. And of course you have that much bigger in Deep Space Nine where the Klingons and the Federation are at war together against a common enemy in the face of the Dominion from, uh, from across the wormhole in the Gamma Quadrant. Um, so Star Trek has the benefit of having so many layers and so many stories that have been told that it can be very nuanced. Because honestly, a television show and we know all this now in the age of streaming video, a television mm-hmm. show can do so much more about being multi-layered and nuanced than a two, even three hour movie. Um, oh, I do want to apologize to our friends, the people who make Star Trek Adventures role-playing game right now, I pronounced the name of the company wrong. It is Modifius. So okay, Modifius, Modifius. is the, awesome. uh, the name of the people who make the Star Trek role-playing game these days. And, uh, you can set it in just about any Star Trek era that you want, um, which is one of the one of the reasons why it has been doing pretty well uh, as a, as a role playing game. Well, and it's and it's and it's I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because 
Um, I don't play as much. I'm actually, br- I'm, I've been branching out, especially with quarantine and COVID and whatnot, branching out to look into other games, into different games. Um, Cause I, my players have really just focused on fifth edition D and D great mm-hmm. system, great game, <clears throat> but I'm going back. I'm realizing that I'm, I'm missing my war gaming. Um, I'm either missing my really heavy war gaming mm-hmm. or I'm really missing like deep RPG um, opportunities that I just don't find in, in some, you know, fantasy settings. So, you know, looking at Savage Worlds and Deadlands and all these other different ones and Mm -hmm. having some fun with it. But, you know, you mentioned Star Trek. So for the folks out there, could you give them a little bit of an explanation of what the RPG consists of or what it could, or what it would be similar to? Yeah, so um, Modifius' Star Trek role-playing game is uh, its similar to um, what Fantasy Flight Games has been doing with their various science fiction games. Uh, mm. Fantasy Flight Games has made lots of Star Wars RPGs, but yep. then they made their own um, uh, unique system, or sort of a generic rule system, um, in that uh, – they have the customizable dice and what have you. But the modifious version of uh, Star Trek doesn't use uh, customized dice. It just uses a large collection of one kind of dice. Uh, mm-hmm. Let me grab the little thing here real quick to make sure that I describe it properly. Um, and you can get uh, their, their, um, their customized dice or their, their specific dice in little Star Trek packages. Um, and it uses... Some D20s and mm-hmm. some D6s. Uh, and it does have iconographic stuff from Star Trek on the dice that you roll. So when you make tests to check your character's skills, if you roll up the Delta symbol, you know, the, the little Enterprise symbol, mm-hmm. that means, hey, something cool is going to happen. And then you count up how many of those symbols you got and see, you know, if you succeed or not. Uh, and then you also have momentum and threat tokens, which are a bit like the tokens that you can use in Deadlands when you have the the poker chips. You you can trade them in to do stuff. Uh, And of course, those tokens, the customized ones are very Star Trek-y in the way they look. Uh, So you've got the the red ones, which are threat ones, are, you know, they're the red alert symbol from from the movies. It's all red red alert. And then the the, uh, momentum ones are the United Federation of Planets symbols. So they're the blue chips there. Oh, cool. And then when you buy your customized dice, your, your, your specific D20s that you roll for your character, you have red ones, blue ones, and yellow ones if your character is either uh, command, which is the yellow rank, mm-hmm. or the mm-hmm. yellow department, science or medicine, which is the blue department, or tactical security, which is the red, red shirt guys. Yep. Um, so the, even though <laughs> throughout the Star Trek television series across time, the colors for di- different departments have gone back and forth, um, it's still classic in our, in our minds as, as gamers and, and sci-fi fans that the gold shirt guy is the guy in charge, the blue shirt guy is the, the geeky science guy, and the red shirt guy is going to die because he's in charge of fighting. Right? Pretty much. So, you know, right, yeah. And so you, you, get, you get similar ideas like that in the, the RPG. Um, I haven't played it as much as I wanted to, just like you. You know, I've you know, during the pandemic, I haven't been able to gather in person, and uh, I'm still old school enough that even though I enjoy podcasting and doing stuff like this with Zoom and, and virtual meetings, when I, I play tabletop them. games, I want to do it all at the same table as everybody else. You know, absolutely, and that's why I remember I saw a <clears throat> post of uh, a post recently of, and actually, I know you were showing some of your Star Wars Legion. Mm-hmm. Um, pictures and I was like man I I need to get back and I, I know some of the game stores here in Charlotte are opening up or they've been open um, and yeah we're yeah. We're lucky because over here in Mint Hill, where I live, we've got your local game store, uh, which you can find out more about at yourlocalgamestore.com. I'm still amazed that Tim got that as his web address. It's literally yourlocalgamestore.com. <laughs> I, I, when, I, when I saw that, I was like, that is the most ingenious, that mm-hmm. is the best name. that, and, I, and I'm surprised no one ever did anything with it. Yeah, yeah. And now he's got it and they have a great website there and they have their own Discord server. Um, But you can't gather there in person in the common gaming areas, just like you can't anywhere else because of the Mm -hmm. pandemic. However, there are three private rooms that your local game store has. 
Yep. And because they're private locations and you pay a fee to rent them, they can still do that. So two Saturdays ago, a group of myself and five friends were able to rent out one of their rooms, meet over there, lock the door, and we could play. We didn't have to wear masks because we all knew we were you know, not infected and we weren't in public. Um, yeah. We were in a private setting. And uh, we were able to play some Warhammer 40K and nice. some 5th edition D&D. So it was great. Oh man, that's nice. It's uh, and and that's actually something I got to really take advantage of, because as we know, Tim and Rebecca are, have been amazing. They're amazing people. They're amazing game store owners. They their their store is just. I remember when it was in the Matthews location. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and I'm so glad that they got the bigger location. Not because I was I felt cramped, but more because there were so many, there was so much opportunity to grow, mm-hmm. and they had that there. So, I, I mean, when they switched to the new location, that was the coolest thing. I felt so proud and so happy for them. Um, but yeah, no, that, that's true, though. There are some stores that are doing private, um, now that I think about it, they're doing those private rooms. And, and, mm-hmm. and actually, that's a great way to kind of get your gaming in while, you know, also being prudent, right? Being prudent yes. about the whole thing. And of course, you can support the store by spending money with them for something other than just product, per se. For sure. So, you know, and, you know, besides products, besides snacks and stuff like that, that's a great way as well to support the store. Um, especially during this time, we really need to be supporting our local stores and um, our local game stores. Now, you mentioned War, uh, Warhammer and whatnot, kind of, and I know that's definitely not RPG in the, regard, in the same regards or in the traditional sense. Um, with something like Warhammer, do you see benefits of maybe dungeon masters, game masters, and, and players, or just, you know, anyone really learning 40 K and learning about those kind of big, uh, strategic skirmish or those, you know, war, really traditional war gaming styles to incorporate in your role-playing game. Oh, for sure. And now is the best time to learn how to play Warhammer 40,000. It's the grandfather of all science fiction tabletop war games. And this month, we're recording this on July the 21st of 2020. Uh, This month, Games Workshop is releasing ninth edition Warhammer 40,000. Uh, the you know new rule book is coming out. Uh, they're streamlining some of the rules, uh, but this is definitely a tactical war game where you build an army of science fiction warriors with incredibly advanced technological weapons and vehicles, and you put them up on your side of the table. Your opponent puts his on the other side. And you go at it with a particular group of objectives that you're trying to secure uh, in in the center or in the edges of the table. And it teaches you a lot as a game master about organizing miniatures, how they interrelate to each other in that space, and using tactics for your monsters to really give your players a challenge. Instead of sometimes game masters, especially dungeon masters, will kind of let the monsters run themselves Now, on the one hand, Mm. having monsters that can sort of run themselves is great because it gives you less to keep up with as a game master. And and that's cool if you want to do that. But every so often, I like to do something for my players to where the goblins start thinking with tactics and they, you know, the guys with slingshots hang back and the guys with short swords run up and they surround you and they, they pick one player and just attack his character exclusively because they have a, a goal in mind of let's take out the cleric or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, when you learn how to play tabletop war games like Warhammer 40,000, you've got to have a plan before you uh, send your guys out there or they'll just get chopped up in, you know, piecemeal fashion and mm-hmm. all your cool space Marines or space orcs are uh, totally destroyed by the end of the second turn. And you're like, I had 500 of these guys. What happened? Well, you didn't have a plan. You didn't have a strategy, you know, and uh, being able to incorporate proper use of miniatures on a tabletop is an invaluable skill if you want to have really dynamic and memorable adventures in your role-playing games, whether it be fantasy like D&D or science fiction. And also, 9th edition 40K is introducing a new way to play the game that actually incorporates a bit of role-playing. Really? And yes, so what they're doing is, instead of just having a one-off match, uh, you can still do that, of course, because that's the bread and butter of the game. But sure. you know how I mentioned there are objectives, right? Well, mm-hmm. you can set up 
escalating games. So like, let's say you and I are going to play on Friday night and we're going to play what's called campaign mode Warhammer 40,000. So okay. you're going to bring a series of units just like you normally would for a regular game, but you're going to name them like the 10th fighting fists or the blood angels infantry 47th regiment or whatever and if they don't get killed by the end of our game on friday night they gain a certain number of experience points and in the book cool. you, you can spend those points to give them new guns or new techniques or new armor or what have you like in a rudimentary rpg yeah and uh and then when we meet again next friday the fighting fists might actually be a little bit tougher than they were the last time that my space orcs faced off against them. But the same would also possibly be true of my space orcs. And if we secure particular objective markers uh, on the tabletop at the end of, of a game, we could get more experience. Uh, so it's like treasure, if you will. And yeah. so we can use it to get, you know, make our, our plasma guns, we could turn them into antimatter rifles, you know, if we had enough resources and experience points. So as the campaign progresses, if you don't die, you get better and more powerful. Interesting. I like that aspect. Yeah. That's very uh, different that, you know, from and, and that perspective, it almost makes the war game um, a little bit more... Uh, there's a lot of value in there, right? There, you know, war gaming and skirmish type games are fun. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're loads of great fun, but, uh, but sometimes we can get caught up in the, well, there isn't necessarily like a storyline or a campaign, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like, uh, I think of like, I go back to world of Warcraft mm -hmm. or like star Wars, old Republic, or, you know, you know, KOTOR, like any of the classic MMORPGs that, had that storyline that yeah you could skirmish you could fight you could raid you could do whatever but there was this storyline underneath um and there i kind of that's kind of how i view the perfect um rpg in my opinion is great skirmishes great battles great combat but with some sort of storyline so i'm really happy to see to hear rather that warhammer is going in that direction now yes and of course there are warhammer 40,000 legitimate role-playing games as for well. Sure. For uh, sure. I had many a great adventure and, and two really good campaigns over the years with Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader. So okay. for those who don't know much about the Warhammer 40k universe, to sum up, uh, the Emperor of Mankind is near death. He's kept alive by a uh, particular life support system, but he is still the de facto leader of this huge empire of man. Uh, humans are pretty much in charge of the galaxy uh, in Warhammer 40,000 in the most developed areas. Uh, and the reason that they are is, A, because the emperor is a powerful telepathic psychic uh, uh, entity, mm -hmm. even in his near-death state. And the, the main reason that they are is because they have genetically engineered superhumans that are these super warriors called space marines that can go and just almost like a like hundred of them could pretty much conquer any planet that you could, that you could name. Um, and so they're amazing fighters, uh, but they usually show up in very small groups. And so uh, it's hard to have an interesting role-playing game, science fiction or otherwise, when all the characters are superhuman warriors like that. So yeah. in the Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader game, you as the players don't play as space marines. You play as regular humans in this world, which regular humans still exist, uh, trillions and trillions of them across thousands of worlds all over the galaxy. Um, and so as rogue traders, you're almost like space pirates because the emperor... 10,000 years ago, the emperor gave out these charters to particular rich families that had their own starships and told them, go out and explore the galaxy. You can keep whatever you find as treasure and salvage and what have you, like traditional privateers. Mm -hmm. uh, but I need you to come back to Earth every so often and send me the information about what you have found. So it was like mercenary explorers because he didn't want to risk his own resources to go out and explore. Which makes sense. Yeah, which – which worked great for the first, say, 1,000 years. Uh, of course, we're talking about traveling faster than light, so time is relative, of course. Um, yeah. But you have family members of the original rogue traders who have kept those ancient, almost totally desiccated scrolls from the emperor with his own mm -hmm. signature on them, sealed in hermetic you know, chambers so that they won't ever truly decay. And that gives them a lot of leeway in a legal sense 
uh, to run around the galaxy doing stuff, especially on the fringes of the galaxy, which is outside of the Imperium of Mankind. Mm. Um, so in the Rogue Trader role-playing game, you and your friends are crew members, usually bridge crew members, of one of these piratey ships that has been given this uh, you know, writ of trade, this charter, to go out and explore and make deals with aliens, and you get to keep whatever crazy artifacts and treasures you find. And most of the time, it's you versus aliens. But a, a, a clever game master, which I like to think that I am, a, a clever game master will have you come back to Earth or come back into the imp- empire every so often and uh, go to sell your stuff, you know, get your gold or your money mm-hmm. or whatever. But then like someone from the Inquisition or the tax office is all, are you sure you guys are supposed to have all these plasma rods? I'm not sure if this is, this, this might be contraband. And so you can have a lot of political political maneuvering, and even economic role-playing, because that's one of the things that science fiction tabletop games lends themselves to more so often than fantasy is economic stuff, because you have a civilization that exists and and a system of trade and Mm -hmm. mercantilism and whatnot that you often don't have in fantasy uh, role-playing games because the technology isn't there. You know, it's medieval Europe at best, right? Very true. And, and, and there's, and I'm actually really glad that you said that because <clears throat> a lot of times role-playing games don't is ju- isn't just about writing a character, writing a backstory, becoming this, and 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 doing all these things. It's how do you play out the political? It's it's being it's really it is truly immersing yourself in that game as that character as that role. So, you know, how do you deal as a you know in the politi- in the political scheme of the world? Something that Star Wars really did well, um, and a lot of people, I know some people don't like the prequels, I know, and, you know, actually, I enjoy them. I enjoy yeah. what they could, I enjoy them because in my brain, in my head, I think, well, there could have been a lot of other cool things. I think Clone Wars did a really good job of bridging that gap. Um, Dave Filoni, as we know, is a great, I mean, he's a fan. He is probably mm, Lucas's yes. protege if you know to say the least um lucas's disciple almost yes and, yes and you know filoni i hope will you know kind of take charge in the regards of storytelling and something that the clone wars did is that they looked into the political aspect right they looked mm-hmm. into both sides and i feel like you get that more with sci-fi uh rpgs than you do with fantasy with fantasy just because y- you really focus on Again, it's it's medieval fantasy, mm-hmm. right? It, it's not you're not dealing with nations. You're dealing with planets who have their own. And yeah, you could. Uh, I mean, it's really just you know, uh, geo you know geopolitical at scale, right? Instead of sure countries or continents or lands or whatever, it's planets. But I feel that because it's dealing with planets, it almost makes you. Um, role play the political as well even if you're just a merchant pirate yep. that's just my opinion though yeah and you're absolutely right um a big draw to science fiction role-playing games is that you have like i said earlier you have those nuances you can have multi-layered approaches to the storyline because the world you're in is more advanced and honestly uh if you look at it from an anthropologist point of view Hmm. It's because you've had time for humans to become more civilized. One of the major reasons that a game like Dungeons and Dragons uh, has the feeling that it does, in in the generic standpoint, naturally, sure. you can you can make your D and D game have all of these things that we've talked about. You can have intrigue at court. You can have multi nation trade states, etc. But the generic D and D setting doesn't usually have much of that. And a lot of pe- players come to Dungeons and Dragons not wanting that type of thing, and that's perfectly fine. But sure. when you when you look at a science fiction tabletop role playing game, you have a society in the case of Warhammer 40k, you have a society that's existed for 10,000 years. That's a lot of time to become more civilized, more refined, and more advanced. Although 40k is the the type of science fiction universe that I refer to, and many people, others do, as grim dark. Because during the time frame that we're talking about, mankind had great heights, and then there were big wars and terrible catastrophes or just horrible fighting into amongst themselves to where they kind of blasted themselves back to the dark ages, if you will. 
and then they've recently, then they would rediscover old technologies and rise up again, and then there'd be another big rebellion or, or some sort of uh, betrayal, and they'd go back down into darkness again. And um, it illustrates uh, the overall arc of human history where we have highs and lows, you know? And so sure. I, I think that after that cycle has gone so many times, but you still have that society that exists, they didn't actually go extinct. Uh, that gives you that multi-layered approach to things way. So, you know, the guy hanging out on wall street today uh, is way more uh, nuanced and subtle about his life than the Viking Raider who came to that area of New York thousands of years ago, right? Correct. And, and it's not because they aren't the same species. They are. They're all humans. But it's because the world they're living in has advanced. And Correct. so that to me is why science fiction tabletop role-playing games are really great for giving that higher level of play, that, that deeper nuance. Um, and, and to me, they really come in three basic flavors because uh, okay. I've, I've played a lot of them. Um, as you can tell from what I've been saying. Uh, and I think I told you uh, when we were getting ready for this episode, um, there's basically three kinds. That is the, the really hopeful and optimistic, uh, almost fantasy in space, like Star Wars. Yeah. Uh, and then you have sort of the middle of the road uh, type of, of, of uh, you know, open to a lot of different interpretations like Star Trek. Uh, and then you have your almost dystopian, always grim, dark type sci-fi atmosphere of Warhammer 40,000. And then also one we haven't talked much about, but the the techno thriller uh, genre like Cyberpunk 2077 yeah. and Shadowrun. That's true. We haven't. I ha yeah. It, thank you for bringing that up because um, if I'm not mistaken, I know that the, the newest Cyberpunk is... Uh being released or it has released or whatever? Yeah, so the, the newest version of the our Telesaurian games, Cyberpunk 2077, uh, has a free version out there now. I think it's okay. called Cyberpunk Red, I believe is what we're called. I mean, I had, yes, Cyberpunk Red is the newest version of it. Uh, and I think the, uh, the Jumpstart kit from last year, uh, it's like 10 bucks on drive-thru RPG. That's uh, not bad I've, at all. And um, yeah, and it's it's basically the the next iteration of a venerable science fiction tabletop game, a classic game from Artelsorian Games. Uh, so Cyberpunk is almost like our world, but just about twenty years at this point, maybe even not twenty whole years into the future, where everything is run by the internet and people are basically cyborgs on the regular because they have uh, neural networks that connect to their bodies that they can plug into the to the system. Or in the case of, uh, I think in in the newest version, just like here in the real world, once again, it's all Wi-Fi. You don't actually have to plug yourself into anything. Hmm. Uh, but people also have replaced some of their internal organs with, you know, cybernetic components. And uh, nobody looks askance at people who live that way because it's standard. It's like a regular part of society. Yeah, it's, it's like, you know, it, it's kind of like, it's almost odd if you didn't have that. Right. It, yeah. You know, it, it's kind of like in the, in the, in some of the movies that I remember, you know, growing up or watching when they bring that, ancient or medieval um character into the future or into the you know or vice versa right they've gone into the past and it's almost like because of the clothes they're wearing it makes them think it makes them stick out like a sore thumb mm -hmm. and I, i've always laughed at that because it's very true actually like in society and <clears throat> culture we don't think about this but actually in today when we look at um you know those who who are you know pennsylvania dutch right? Or mm -hmm. who are Quakers. When we yeah. see their attire, we say, well, wait a minute, that's kind of weird. That's, that's a little bit different. Um, and it's, you know, nothing wrong with it. It's just, it's, you know, quote unquote different. So in, in an RPG, in the same like with cyberpunk and things like that, it actually, I, I want to actually ask you this, when you game master those type of, you know, scenarios or, or those type of, you know, when you have those sessions, are you, or, you know, are you particularly being that um, detailed, right? So, like, let's take cyberpunk, right, where there's cyber, you know, they have, um, you know, the mix of organic and, and uh, technological um, body parts and things like that. And mm -hmm. let's say there's a player who actually says, you know what, I kind of want to just be like normal organic human. Is the system itself um, that developed where the game master is given instruction if, 
if a player wants to do this to, you know, treat, not to treat them, but to, you know, role play this particular way, or is that more of a kind of a specific game master trope? So it's up to the individual game master and player as to how that society is going to treat their character okay. um, in, in your own sessions. Correct, However, correct. The, the, the atmosphere, the universe at large does talk about how people who eschew technology or who don't want to have implants or whatnot uh, would be viewed as a little bit out of the ordinary. Um, but, you know, that gives you great character development space and great storytelling space because there are groups of people in some of these dystopian futures like this who are all about humanity first. I don't want to have cybernetic parts, and I think it's wrong that other people do. I want mm. to promote a clean or a true and genuine biological future because as it is now if we keep going down this road humans as we know them will cease to exist and we can't let that happen i've got to protect the purity of our species right yeah. which which to our ears sounds kind of silly because you know my dad has a stint in his heart according to the humanity first people he's got technology inside him and he yeah. no longer counts as a human and we shouldn't do that well, to us here in the 21st century, that sounds stupid. If I need to have a insulin pump or if I lose my arm uh, you know, as an American soldier and, and, and I get a replacement limb, that doesn't make me less of a human. But see, that's because in our society, we or have come to- Or if your father to... chops off your hand with his lightsaber. Exactly. And I get a robot hand, right? I'm just saying. Uh, you know, <laughs> it doesn't make me less of a human, right? Exactly. But see, but see what that is is it gives a, a smart science fiction author and a, a shrewd game master an opportunity perhaps to use it as an allegory, a lens to mm. talk about racial purity, which is a hot topic these days, right? Very and true. people, the interrelationship between different races, because it's silly for the cyborgs and the humans to argue about who's more human, but it's also silly for black people and white people to argue about who's more human and who's right. But we can't tell people that directly to their face, because even in our society, that causes a lot of stress and tension and, and pressure. But true. if we make up a story about cybernetic samurai, and they're talking to people who want true you know, humanity first, we can teach that lesson and broach those subjects without necessarily offending people so much. So we can have a lot of fun because how much do you want to play a game I just said about cybernetic samurai? Um, yeah, I was going to say, can, I really want to. Right? We can, we can have a lot of fun with cybernetic samurai and we can do good by helping broach a subject that is very uncomfortable without these trappings of science fiction. Now and you could tell- Star Trek did. Exactly. And, and Star Wars did a lot of that, too, because it uh, helped talk about the dangers of war and why violence was bad during the Vietnam era without mentioning Vietnam by name. Right. And yeah. so, you know, it also brought different philosophies to to light. Um, it brought the philosophy of, you know, having to or, or rather it brought certain philosophies, stoicism. Right. Sometimes mm -hmm. you have that like like Ben Kenobi, I would go back. I would say that he's, uh, he, maybe not the perfect Stoic, uh, but he is, a, he, there is some Stoicism to, you know, to his uh, demeanor, to his way of thinking. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe he's not Marcus Aurelius. Maybe he's, you know, something else, but anyway, y'all, y'all get it. Like, yeah. you know, Yoda, right. Great. You know, he's, he's, and, and again, what I love, what I, what I feel that we kind of missed the opportunity a little bit with the prequels, but, you know, you, you kind of have to think and go further from there is that Yodo that you see in the movie, in the original trilogy, is a master who has lost, a, you know, they lost a lot of things, but they re, they had to think about how they viewed you know the force in this sense the jedi in this case um he had certain and of, and of course yoda i mean in 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 the empire strikes back when dagobah he you know when he's telling ben kenobi he's not ready he's this all these different things are tropes of the force and the belief of the force in the jedi that he had while he was grand master mm -hmm. and he's in dagobah almost as a as a way of penance in my opinion, he trying to, you know, to reconnect with the force. Cause if you notice 
he never teaches Luke lightsaber combat, um, right. or at least that we visually see. But he never teaches him that because he swore off lightsaber combat. Lightsaber yes. combat for him is no longer, he's not worthy to hold, you know, to, to have his lightsaber. Very similar to Bushido Code and a little bit of Taoism and Buddhism where um, when, when the warrior, and, and specifically with the samurai, when the warrior felt that they were not worthy of their weapon, which was their soul, they would not fight with the weapon. Hence the reason you see, you know, a lot, yes, jujitsu and judo are those things that stemmed out of it, but it's unarmed combat because the warrior, the warrior soul was in their weapon. It was an extension. So I do see how Star Wars brought a lot of those philosophies, just like Star Trek brought a lot of the cultural and societal things that, you know, like you said, when you tell it in a story, when you play it in a game, it makes it a little bit different. You know, you mentioned about how cyber, cybernetic humans aren't real humans. Well, we would think, of course, they're real humans. What mm-hmm. would make them any different? And especially, like you said, in today's culture, we know that, well, there, there are many opposing sides right now um, in dif- you know, that have different creeds and different ethnicities. I don't want to say racist because we're all the human race. We're, exactly. we're the same. Yep. We're, we're the human race. You know, we may have different ethnic backgrounds, but that doesn't mean that we're not, that we're better than one another. It yeah. means that we just come from different areas and, you know, things develop differently. But Star Trek and sci-fi told us that. Yes. It taught us that. And I feel that we should have more uh, sci-fi games. We, we should actually see more sci-fi RPGs, like streams and whatnot, than we should fantasy. And that's my opinion because I don't think there is a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're right. And, and part of it is because sometimes science fiction leans too heavily on the science aspect of it, and people start to tune out because they didn't have great experiences with science class in, in school, right? Mm. And you know, they're like, ah, science, science isn't really my thing. You know? And so I think that this goes back to we need to promote scientists as the rock stars that they are and help them, even the non-geologist ones. <laughs> and uh, anyway, and so, uh, and, you know, and yeah, and, and help the, the average person to care more about, understand better and realize how cool science really is, right? How fascinating it is. Um, it is uh, the perfect example of Arthur C. Clarke's famous quote, the, the author of 2001 and Space Odyssey, when he said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And then that was the full mm. quote. And it's true for people who don't have that basic scientific knowledge. You know, when I help my dad with his, uh, with his computer or when I help my mother-in-law with her smartphone and it's not working and I fix it for them and it's working great, they're just – they're amazed. They're just like, oh, thank you so much. This is so great. I could never have done that. And – it's like magic to them, not because they don't understand that it's based in real scientific principle. They do, but it's so far beyond what they had learned about that to them, this might as well be magic. In the Warhammer 40,000 universe, I, mean, I talked about those highs and lows of society for humans. Mm-hmm. Well, we've in, in the 40, 41st millennium where the game is currently set, um, we've reached a point where, yes, this space marine knows how to use his plasma rifle, and he does all of these things to keep it working, but he does them as prayers to the machine god, because if it were to be completely disassembled into all of its component parts, he would not know how to put it back together, because he doesn't really know how plasma induction technology functions, because that knowledge has been lost Mm. thousands of years ago, but he and some of his you know, esteemed brothers within the church of the Omnissiah of technology mm-hmm. have been given the rights to hold this thing and they are to protect it with their life because the, the Imperium no longer possesses the technological knowledge of how to build new plasma guns. Any of them that get lost or get destroyed, they're gone forever. So the space Marine's life is worth less than his gun because we can make new space Marines, you know, the, the old fashioned way, but we cannot make, we cannot make new plasma guns because we've lost that technology. And sometimes in the campaign version of the game, 
your objective will be an ancient computer system that still has the blueprint file for making plasma rifles. We got to get it before the bad guys get it. Otherwise, they'll know how to make plasma rifles. And we won't. So there we have technology is so advanced, it almost seems like magic, right? And so I think that a big part of a good science fiction role-playing game is incorporating a society where science is science. It's not magic. And so people don't necessarily have that reverence for it or that fear and distrust of it. It's part of their daily routine, which is why you know I feel the ones that have the optimistic idea like Star Wars and then Star Trek are sometimes a, a, a more deep and rich environment than the grim dark ones like Cyberpunk and Warhammer 40K because in Cyberpunk, you do have those various levels of technological understanding. And, in, and like I just described in 40K, sometimes they basically treat it like beyond magic to a religion, you know? Yeah, it's almost as if, and, and it makes me think, I forget which anime it is, but there's one specifically where, actually, it's, it's um, Fire Force. It's a newer anime where okay. basically the premise is the, there's a church of soul that mm -hmm. essentially is they're, they're a fire they're, they look like modern day firefighters but they have you know religious symbols on them and they put out uh, fires that are caused by demons but oh. it's really it's really interesting because some of the technology and you know they talk about ancient japan well not ancient japan as we know they talk about ancient japan as uh, as in 21st century japan Mm -hmm. of this what is this railroad system how did this work you know what type of sorcery was this right and in reality it was the you know it was engine it was modern day engineering that is the yeah. answer to it so it, it's it's really interesting that it almost seems like you know there's magics on one side and then technologies in the middle and then you know past technology where it almost goes back to like proto or post you know, magic where you almost think it's, it's almost an obsession. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. this piece of technology is not magic, but it is gifted to us by the gods. So yeah. we must defend it or this piece of technology. And again, it, you usually find it in the uh, games where um, again, that it's like big organization, um, big religious organization, whatever it may be that's saying you, you know, this thing is not of the gods. This thing is a curse and you, you know, are a sacred warrior that must protect it with your life. When in reality yep. it's, oh, if someone actually just reverse engineered this, you know, this plasma gun, you would yeah. actually find out what it does and how to build it. Yep, exactly. And one of the uh, current sci-fi role-playing games that does a good job of, of reaching that middle ground you were talking about is uh, Shadowrun. So in Shadowrun, you do have high technology, like, you know, energy weapons and a worldwide computer network, internet and hackers mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. But Shadowrun also has magic. And there oh, are cool. shaman. There are shaman and wizards and what have you. And it even has the uh, futuristic versions of our favorite alien, uh, you know, or, sorry, our favorite fantasy races and sub races like orcs and dwarves and trolls, right? So trolls exist in Shadowrun and they can help you be computer hackers or they can, you can have a troll who's a, a member of your adventuring party and you go out and you fight against a bunch of monsters with, you know, energy swords and, and automatic machine guns and, and whatnot. That's um, cool. Yeah, it's a very, very much almost anything goes in the near future with Shadowrun. Uh, and another big near future science fiction universe that was having a huge amount of success, like going like gangbusters up until recently, is the Android universe, which is what Fantasy Flight Games had for their Netrunner card game. Um, okay, okay. And so there are Android universe role-playing games um, because of a dispute between licensing with Wizards of the Coast and Fantasy Flight Games. Sadly, the Netrunner card game is no more. But they still own the intellectual property rights for their Android universe that they created. Oh, nice. So they still have role-playing game supplements for their systems that you can play in FFG's uh, Android universe. So you can still be a Netrunner, which is what they call hackers in their world. Um, and what I've heard people doing, I've never played the Android RPG. I'd like to give it a try because I loved the Netrunner card game. Um, people will 
you know, be rolling dice and doing the normal tabletop role-playing game for like hand-to-hand combat or investigations or whatnot. But when it comes time to hack the computer network, they put the dice away for a moment. The game master plays as the corporation in the card game who sets up all these data forts that he's trying to protect. Mm-hmm. And then the players work together as, as a net runner in the, the runner side of the card game. And they try to hack the individual data servers, you know, throughout the, so instead of rolling dice, which you can do uh, to resolve that test, they actually mm-hmm. stop that game and they play a little game within a game of hacking That's the cool. computer system. I, I, I love doing stuff like that. It really yeah. helps I- immerse the players into the story, you know? And, and that's something I really like, um, you know, and you, I don't know if how, how much you play like X-Wing miniatures and whatnot, but mm-hmm. it would be a real, you know, something like that, adding it to a Star Wars RPG would be really cool because you get to, oh, again, a game within a game where you get to support other games, you get to learn about other games. And yeah, you can do this in a fantasy setting, right? You could, you could quite honestly take, you know, something like, uh, you know, if you're playing a and d game and you could take, you know, if you're going to do naval combat, you mm-hmm. could take the old pirates uh, trading card game, the old, yeah. or you could take the new, um, I think it's by, um, I'm trying to, th- Blood in a, what is it? Blood in... Blood and Plunder, is it? It's a pirate skirmish type game. Yeah, I, believe. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, you could take something yeah. like that and you can kind of, you know, you could put the game within the game. But I, but again, going back to the sci-fi aspect of it, it's interesting now with, with Netrunner, I, I remember watching games at your local game store, but I never played them. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately that stinks that you can't, uh, you can't, I don't know. Well, maybe you could go on eBay and purchase Oh, old. for sure. And there's a player's committee that has kept the card game going. So you can download cards and print them out. Um, oh, nice. And of course, you can still find the game for sale in certain places. Um, but uh, but yeah, eBay, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, because I was going to say, um, you know, one of the things that I've been questioning and wondering and, and pondering about, too, is if I want to start playing a sci-fi, you know, RPG, which one should I choose? And how do I, and how, what, you know, is there a community behind it so that I can learn mm-hmm. more, get involved in the lore? Because with Warhammer, I'm not going to lie, the audiobooks, um, even though I try to buy the books as much as I can, the audiobooks are so convenient while you're working. Oh, for or sure. While, you know, yeah, you can listen to list or on the road, whatever it may be. And um, I try to listen to the audiobooks, that, but there are, there's so much content for the audiobooks, it's almost overwhelming. So do you have any insight on what, what games you would recommend getting into? So I think a really good uh, entree into science fiction role-playing uh, for people who, who want a, a game that's currently supported, it's relatively easy to play, and you can find people that are still doing it, uh, would be Shadowrun. Um, okay. Because it has just enough fantasy hanging around with the trolls and the magic and the shaman and whatnot that I think that you could still feel like you had that grounded sense if you're, especially if you, if you've just played Dungeons and Dragons and you want to spread out from there. Um, And Shadowrun just had sixth edition come out. So they're, they're definitely uh, within uh, well supported by um, uh, Catalyst Games. I think it's Catalyst Games. Uh, Let me check real quick. Do, do, do. Yes. Catalyst Catalyst Game Labs. Catalyst Um, Game Labs. Okay. Got it. Yeah. And, uh, um, and like I said, if you're interested more in the 40K side of things, uh, doing the campaign mode of a game of Tabletop 40,000 is basically a good Warhammer role-playing game. But you can find the Warhammer 40K Rogue Trader books uh, super cheap out there. Uh, the game okay. isn't actually made anymore. Um, it may come back around fairly soon. I've heard rumors about it relaunching. Really? Um, but for now... Um, you can find the used books or, or at drive through RPG. If you just want to do eBooks, um, they're, they're pretty cheap. Yeah. I'm a, I, I like the physical copy again. I like being in, in the presence of my friends too physically. Yeah. So if I can help that, um, but you mentioned something that actually just, it really stuck to stuck with me. You mentioned about how, if we promoted more of the science, you know, of, of the sciences, right. In, mm-hmm. in our country, in our society, really in our, we would see more um, kind of more flight towards our, our own advancement in technology, but we would see a positive stereotype with 
science and you know sci-fi sure now with that statement being said because i've thought about this too because i I feel that we demonize sometimes the quote on you know the quote-unquote um sci-fi games Mm -hmm. it's almost like that's the ultra geek that's the yes that is that is too geeky even amongst us nerds bearded or otherwise we ostracize (laughs) the guy who's big into star trek and we're like oh the pocket protect well no no more pocket protectors but you know like oh that guy lives in his mom's basement he just gets online and rants about how much he hates star trek discovery or or how much he loves it because you know it's different than this or that and we're like ah yeah the sci-fi nerds are the worst kind of nerds right but they're (laughs) but they're not you know if we didn't if it weren't for those original star trek fans in the 1960s that campaigned to save their tv show we wouldn't have nerd culture right those mm-hmm. people getting together and writing letters to cbs was this, was the genesis of what supports what you and i do in our podcasts it supports comic con it supports all the games we play the idea of streaming someone playing a video I didn't game think about that Come on, right? If we didn't have those original hardcore sci-fi nerds from the Star Trek original series Save the Show campaign, which was all handwritten letters, or at the very least typewritten letters, uh, you know, that's the genesis of nerd culture. How, how dare we denigrate those people, right? That's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but, but you're right. We do it. We still we categorize each other because that's human nature. But you know mm. what can help teach us about overcoming that human nature and a more unified future? Science fiction, of course, and in this case, science fiction role playing games. Now, you mentioned your podcast, and I want to, you know, I want to talk a little bit of, of more about it because, you know, it's been a bit since you've been on, you've been back on the show. So I want to see yeah. how you're doing with the podcast. How's everything going? I know we were, I was on um, the podcast uh, talking about, you know, for Star Wars Celebration. So how's everything mm-hmm. been on the, on your show? Oh, our show is going like gangbusters. I can't say enough positive things. Uh, We, uh, What a Piece of Junk, a Star Wars podcast. We are part of the Fandom Podcast Network, which is a a large network that, as you can guess from the name, embraces all sorts of fandoms, fantasy, sci-fi, action movies, sports, uh, uh, mysteries, uh, horror films, what ever you think of um we categorize nerds but we don't ostracize any of them so um we uh you <laughs> know we, we we have we have a show focused on star wars that's us what a piece of junk we have a star trek and orville show uh oh, cool. for for that side of fandom there's a doctor who podcast uh there's a alfred hitchcock podcast a, a nfl football podcast uh, a highlander podcast a fantasy podcast uh, and then, of course, our flagship show is the Culture Clash podcast, which kind of is a roundup of all genre news and happenings at that time each each month uh, or each each every other week. Um, our show, What a Piece of Junk, uh, recently passed, I think, about 400 downloads for the Empire Strikes Back episode, 40th anniversary spectacular that you, you were on, Brian. So thank you nice. very much. Uh, and then for the entire FPN altogether, uh, we are north of like 68,000 downloads. Loads, um, Dang, that's awesome. Which is, which is amazing. So I can't say enough good things about uh, my co-hosts, uh, Nathan Miracle and Derek Marsh over on What a Piece of Junk. And then our network uh, czars, uh, Kevin Reitzel <laughs> and Kyle Wagner, who do Culture Clash and a variety of other podcasts there. They're just the greatest guys. And I'm so grateful that they gave us that opportunity to talk about Star Wars. Now, and actually, and that's pretty, and you know, I, I, on, I really do enjoy your podcast and I really like the perspectives that y'all have had because it's somewhat difficult nowadays in my, and again, my opinion, but it's somewhat difficult to have people kind of find the silver lining in the prequels, the trilogy and the sequels. Yes. Um, I've spoken to some of my good friends about, about it and we've, you know, we've had our groanings and moanings of, of the sequels. I think we could have seen different things. Um, I think, you know, but again, we also enjoyed the Mara Jade era, mm-hmm. right? Where, yes. you know, and I think that was something that was missed. Oh, in, my, in my, my, my beautiful bride cosplayed as Mara Jade several times. She was an unbelievably awesome 
uh, cosplayer for that character. It helps that she has red hair on the regular. Um, and uh, oh, people go. people would stop us in the street at Dragon Con to get a picture taken with her. And, uh, you know, I'd be the guy holding the camera for them. But uh, but I didn't <laughs> mind, you know, uh, and it wasn't just because she was beautiful. It was because that, like the character, she portrayed and exuded that strength, that inner confidence, right? And I feel that as much as I am sad that Mara Jade's no longer canon, I feel that we still have that strong archetype in Star Wars, perhaps brought even more to the forefront with Rey Skywalker. You know, mm. I, I'm, I feel like Star Wars is like pizza. Even when it's bad, it's still good. You know, like it's, it's pretty much hard for me to find a pizza that I don't agree with on some huh. level. And so for me, Star Wars is like pizza like that. Um, and uh, I think that good science I'm going to quote you because well, that's thanks. a really good yes. quote. I, I would gonna, love to say that was an original thought, but it probably isn't. But uh, um, I'm still going to quote you, so uh, <laughs> okay, you'll see yeah, a tweet right. from me soon. No, that's <laughs> very true. I never thought about that. Um, and I think, I think they just could have – I think I, – and again, I feel that with Ray Skywalker, okay, being mm-hmm. Palpatine – well, I get – I don't know. Is it – it should be – it shouldn't be a spoiler alert. But it's, uh, no, it's we're we're seven months away from from the the movie being out. I think we're fine. Yeah. Uh, so it you know it's she's Palpatine's granddaughter, mm-hmm. which you think to yourself, okay, if if she's Palpatine's granddaughter, and then you know obviously he had a son and all these mm-hmm. different things. That's gr- That's cool. I want now. I want more of it. Just like when they released you know when with the Clone Wars, right? Mm-hmm. Great animated series. Which great. Honestly, it's a great family show. Great for kids. Great for it. I would almost say it's in that line of animated series that's great for everyone because of the story it tells. Um, like Avatar: The Last Airbender. Um, it, it's yes. a great show. And now that they've given us the Bad Batch, I want to see more of it. I also want to see more of Republic Commandos. I want to. Mm-hmm. I really want to see that. So regarding Rey Skywalker, I want to see what she does with future force wielders is she going to name them skywalkers are they going to be traditionally called jedi because that you know that is really what the a force you know a a force sensitive um wielder who wields a a light you know kind of that and again that that kind of mentality of what are we going to get from this how are we going to go from here and a lot of people have talked about episode eight i i I mean trust me i've had my qualms with it but i also think and this is something this might not be a popular opinion kylo ren aka ben solo i think was it was a fantastic example of character development yeah totally star wars has always had in my opinion almost stronger villains than it has heroes right? Darth Mm -hmm. Vader is one of the most developed and nuanced character in all of media, right? And Kylo Ren follows in that footsteps. Um, And I think that good science fiction gives you all those multiple layers and multiple pathways of, of thinking about the core conflict, right? And to me, good science fiction tabletop role playing games give you more options than just, do you want to be good at killing orcs with a sword or do you want to be good at killing orcs with magic right yeah. and you you can of course expound d and d so that you're not limited to that choice obviously uh, sure. but but at the core of it it's really hard to have a dungeons and dragons character who is an actual pacifist right because oh, every yeah, class yeah. somewhere somewhere along the way is gonna have to fight whether it's firebolt longsword flurry of blows backstab whatever yeah. right um so to vicious me, mockery <laughs> vicious mockery yes yeah e- even a, even a bard occasionally will sing a song that is designed to kill you right exactly. so um to me one of the best things about science fiction role-playing games and science fiction in general is you you, you hit on this a bit when we talked about yoda a little while ago after he lost his lightsaber combat lightsaber duel with darth sidious yoda eschewed the blade and he went off to Dagobah into isolation. Initially, I believe he did it, but like you said, like Bushido warrior code, he felt his soul was no longer worthy of wielding the blade. Right. Mm -hmm. But over time in a very Buddhist type way, Yoda came to realize that the blade was never the answer to that problem in the first place. 
And so he mm. became a strict pacifist. Well, in a Star Wars role-playing game from Fantasy Flight Games, or certainly within a Star Trek role-playing game from our friends at Mephidias, you can play a character that is truly pacifistic, and all they do during the action sequences is maybe use their engineering skill to keep the shields up and keep the, the, the ship functioning properly, and a good storyteller will give them a conflict that is man versus the machine, or even in the case of Star Wars, a good storyteller will let the pacifistic character uh, do all of the force-related stuff and do all of the d- diplomacy-related stuff where what they really have to overcome, the, the real conflict, is man versus himself, right? And that Yoda had to overcome his desire or his perhaps his first instinct of turn on the lightsaber and chop Sidious, strike me down, I'll, you know, and that'll be what I want you to do. He, he realized that Violence was not the answer, which that's George Lucas's message has always been war makes good men do bad things because he was anti-Vietnam and anti-war and he should have been. Uh, And so we come to a point in our role playing game version of that where, okay, it's time to fight the stormtroopers, but I have a Jawa who is a pacifist. Well, if it's Dungeons and Dragons, I'm going to be kind of bored for the combat encounter, right? If my yeah. gnome is a pacifist, maybe I could get away with doing, uh, I'll be an illusionist and I'll try to scare the orcs away, right? Well, it doesn't always work so well because d d is very central around combat. Combat takes up most of the sections of the book. Um, for sure. When you down to, <laughs> the equipment is usually presented in how it's useful in combat. The spells yep. are presented in how they're useful in combat. The classes are talk about how what they do in combat, which is fine. I've played more Dungeons and Dragons than I can possibly remember. I don't <laughs> hate the right, but when it comes to science fiction role playing games, you're going to have those options to where it's about puzzle solving, and you can have a Yoda type character in your Star Wars or a Spock type character in your Star Trek, to where you can actually embrace that pacifism and it's the quintessential example of how the rules for a science fiction tabletop role-playing game mirror the tonality of a science fiction story where you should be accepting of all kinds of viewpoints and i love how you brought that up because um i know that there was a conversion done i actually have played it before um where it is a conversion of star wars fifth edition but it actually plays very much like you stated um, where the, the, the character that I'm playing and it's for behold a D and D podcast for, mm-hmm. uh, for that stream where, and it's actually, we would love to be playing together, but we all live in different States. So it's not yep. as possible yep. um, until one of us can master um, some sort of, you know, instantaneous flight. Or, yes. or, or travel um, or yeah, teleportation yeah. rather. But right. I'm playing a force wielder that is a little bit truer to, because we're playing in like the Knights of the Old Republic era. Um, nice. Yeah, we love that era. We think it was a fantastic, I mean, if you haven't played Kotar folks, I, I, I can't say enough, in, enough about it. It was fantastic. It was one of those legendary games. Yes, Absolutely. Um, And my my friend Manjani Oso is a developer with Electronic Arts. He works on the Star Wars The Old Republic MMO, which is set in uh, very close to the same time frame as Knights of the Old Republic. And uh, I want to say a shout out to Manjani and his team, because as of today, July the 21st, Star Wars The Old Republic is available on Steam. So you can download SWOTOR on Steam. So if you've ever wanted to try Star Wars The Old Republic, by the time you listen to this episode of Bearded Nerd, you'll be able to find it on your Steam store. That is legit because that, again, behold a stream, um, Mm -hmm. the same part of the same branch, my dungeon master, game master, and and really close friend, Sam, he plays it because it's such a great game. It's such a fantastic game. Um, but anyway, the character I'm playing is a pacifist. It is someone who the force is the force. That is kind of the, that is his saying. Um, his name's actually it's kind of funny. His name is Cal Jordan. Um, oh, cool. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So a, a little hint to my DC fans out there, but yeah. you know, he believes in the force that the force is, you know, there is no Sith and there are no Jedi. It's just the force. Mm-hmm. And 
um, the force allows us to move and act in ways that um, are in tune with nature. And therefore, if the force does not guide me to this place or does not guide me to defend, you know, if I defend myself, that's fine, but I will do it quickly. I will do it efficiently and effectively. Mm -hmm. And if someone, and if I must protect someone, great, I can do that. But is the force guiding me? I, it, I would say that I'm as pacifist as I can, um, you know, without totally disregarding obviously some, you know, combat encounters. Cause like you said, D and D, a lot of fan, a lot of um, medieval fantasy games tend to be based upon combat. And then they layer it with a lot of storytelling, mm -hmm. which is, right. that's fine. That's great. And I think there's a really good, um, I think there are great things with, you know, in that regard, but with science fiction and again, Star Wars, Star Trek, Oh, it's thundering in my area. Awesome. Oh, hey. <laughs> That's, um, well, hopefully the audience didn't hear it because it about jump, you know, made me jump out of my seat. <laughs> but um, I think that's the difference. I feel like that's a big difference. And, um, you, know, you know, we were talking about, um, and we, we were talking about Star Wars and whatnot in, in your podcast. Um, and what, something I want to I wanna ask you before I forget is do you you know, again, hosting, you know, having, you know, hosting this podcast and hosting, you know, being really more in depth with Star Wars science fiction and whatnot. Um, how do you see the current take on science fiction? You know, I know that, if, you know, we have our, we have the fans, which we appreciate and love all the mm -hmm. fans of, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, um, Marvel, right? DC. Yeah. And a lot of have, and, and same thing with fifth edition. We see that Critical Role brought a lot of fifth edition people to play fifth edition. Yeah. And it could be that Marvel movies brought a lot of new fans to Marvel. Mm -hmm. How, is th what's going on with Star Wars and science fiction? Uh, you know, what's drawing audience members to that, in your opinion, at least? So when it comes to Star Wars, uh, you know, people uh, who are necessarily not huge fans of the sequel trilogy, they want to point out how uh, episode eight or episode nine, depending on which side of the coin you're on, didn't uh, have as much success as episode seven. And that mm. is monetarily true, but none of those movies are what we would consider a flop, right? Star okay. Wars is still drawing huge audiences and a, sure. big, and a big audience for Star Wars these days has been drawn to Star Wars The Mandalorian over on Disney+. Plus. And yes. so the, 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 the answer to that question is the good Star Wars that brings in those big audiences has respect for the technology both behind the camera and in front of the camera and also has respect for the heart of a good story both mm. behind the camera and in front of the camera. If you keep both of those things in their proper balance, <laughs> it's Star Wars. Uh, if you keep those things in a proper balance, you're going to have you a huge, thank you, a huge amount of success, right? Because that's yeah. what makes Star Wars so much lightning in a bottle is that balancing factor of technology and heart, right? And uh, it, it goes almost all the way back to what I mentioned at the very start of this episode. So here's a good segue to, for, for the close out. If, if you have those cybernetic parts in you, right, it's okay as long as you don't let it make you lose your humanity, okay? Mm -hmm. And science fiction to me, role-playing games, stories, otherwise, it's all about a man being in a, fan, a fantastical and futuristic world but still wanting to hold on to that humanity. It's why Spock, Kirk, and McCoy make such great characters right because they're all three archetypes mccoy's focused on humanity and 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 love for fellow man hippocratic oath spock is all logic and intellect and and uh you know doing things the most efficient way possible and understanding why things happen the way they do in the scientific method right and kirk is the guy in the middle he's us he's the everyman trying to listen to both sides of his psyche his right brain mm. mccoy his left brain spock and he's trying to figure out how to work it out right a good science fiction role playing game incorporates that idea multi-layered nuanced players have to make choices sometimes those choices are which setting to use on the phaser sometimes those choices are how to talk to the klingon ambassador to prevent 
you know, a galactic wide war, right? Sometimes yeah. those choices are how much money should I pay Watto for this piece of a droid? Sometimes those <laughs> choices are, should I use the force to choke this stormtrooper? Because I could do that and like kill him silently to protect my team members from being noticed. But if I do, I'm tapping into the dark side and I'm using the force for personal gain and to inflict pain on others. Is that what I should do, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's about making those moral choices in a way that it's clothed or, or, or draped in, in sci-fi trappings uh, so that we don't feel as much tension and we aren't as offended as much as we might be if it was just a straight up choice like that, you know, right in your face. And so I think that's why uh, tabletop role-playing games that are science fiction in nature, their time has come, right? We're going to see more of them and people will be more into them because the, the storytellers are starting to understand that you have to balance that technology with that humanity. You have to balance that, that science with heart. And, it, and when you have stories like the Marvel ones that do that, because there's plenty mm. of science fiction in Marvel, let's be honest. For sure. Um, but it's balanced with that heart of, of the heroic characters, you know. Stan Lee once said, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, DC is about ideas. We, Marvel, are about characters. And that's true. Yeah. If, you look at, if you look at the way those stories are told, right? And the same thing is true about good science fiction. It's about – good science fiction, though, takes both of those things and balances them together. Grandiose ideas – told by compelling characters they marry if, them they marry them together and if you can merge that uh matter and antimatter in your science fiction tabletop story mm -hmm. your players will be knocking on your door to keep playing their, your game they will stay in your house they will they will sleep on your couch and you'll be like hey the game was over last night you got to go home i speak from personal experience that has happened to me many a times well that's awesome scott thank you so much for being on the show folks um you can catch um, Scott on his podcast. Where uh, exactly can they find you? Um, any, sp any website specifically? Sure thing. Uh, on Facebook, we have the What a Piece of Junk, a Star Wars podcast Facebook group. If you're looking for us on Twitter, we are at What Wars. And I'm, my personal Twitter is at Scotticus Max. And of course, if you just Google Fandom Podcast Network, you can find that website. Um, and we do have some cool t-shirts over at TeePublic. So if you go to TeePublic.com, you can get a Fandom Podcast Network shirt or a What a Piece of Junk shirt. And as you can probably have guessed, uh, the listeners probably have guessed, I am also a writer. I write my own science fiction books and you can find my author website at writegreatscott.com. Awesome. Well, the links will be down below for sure because this is actually going to be going on the YouTubes as well. So Scott, thank you so much for being on the show. It's always a pleasure to hang out with you and talk with you. Can't wait to, for some of this to die down so that we can actually game in person together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have my Warhammer 40,000 Indomitus 9th Edition starter set or collection box on reserve at your local game store. So when, when things calm down, Brian, I'm going to teach you how to play 40K and, uh, and, and you're going to love it. I would love that. I'd really appreciate it. Well, folks, that's the episode. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to like and subscribe to the podcast, like and subscribe to the channel. Let me know how we're doing. And also feel free to comment below and tell me what episodes you want to hear, but also tell me what you think about this. Do you agree with us? Do you not agree with us? Tell us your opinion. But until next time, folks, keep gaming.